OK, so before we delve into the Cherish project and what it's all about, I'm going to share with you the agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to start with an introduction for Cherish, uh, what we've done, what the project has been about. We'll then hear for uh, we'll hear a talk by Professor Sarah Davis from the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at Aberystwyth University, and that's going to be on communicating climate change. Uh, we're then going to move on to some activities that will be conducted in small groups in breakout rooms. These activities are based on some of the um, activities that you'll find in the resources pack that we've developed. We're then going to move on to showcasing our most recent output, which is the animation of Dina Stintze. Uh, it's, a it's all about a changing landscape through time. And then finally, um, I'll finish with presenting the resources to you and highlighting some of the key features to help you with your curriculum planning and how they can be used in the classroom. So CHERISH stands for Climate, Heritage and Environments of Reefs, Islands and Headlands. It's a cross-disciplinary project that has been funded by EU funds over the last six years. It's a partnership project between Aberystwyth University Aberystwyth University and the Royal Commission in Wales, but also the Discovery Programme and Geological Survey in Ireland. Um, and we've achieved the following aims. So we've looked at reconstructing past environments and weather history, uh, discovering, assessing, mapping and monitoring heritage on land and beneath the sea, uh, targeting data and knowledge gaps to raise awareness of heritage in remote coastal locations, and finally establishing new metrically accurate baseline data and recording standards. A lot of that is quite technical speak, and it's been my job as the Education and Outreach Officer to try and um, translate some of this into uh, classroom applicable concepts and information that we can pass on to our young people. So the ambition of Cherish was to increase the capacity and the knowledge of climate change adaptation for the Welsh and Irish sea and coastal communities. So we've got a number of sites across Wales and Ireland uh, and you can see some of the Welsh sites highlighted uh, in the map on the right. If you're, um, we've tried to design the resources so that wherever you are in Wales, there is an applicable um, sort of concept. So whether it direct, directly relates to some of our sites will be based largely on where you are located. Um, but hopefully there are enough resources within the, there is, there's enough material within the resources for you to apply it to your own local area. And that really was the the key for these resources was to make it applicable for anybody wherever you are in Wales. So to understand what Cherish really investigates, uh, here's a diagram that represents the three themes, environments, climate and people. So it's important to understand how they interact with each other to help us understand change, changing climate, changing environments and changing communities and people. So this way we can look at how we adapt to change in the present and future. When we think of climate, we're looking at weather patterns over time um, and Cherish has specifically looked at climate since the last ice age 20,000 years ago. So we know that climate change drives environment change. And so by understanding past climate, we can understand how environments have changed. What we mean by environments includes the following things like oceans, rivers, lakes, valleys and mountains, coastal regions and so on. And the environment and how it is made up directly shapes how people use environments. So, for example, forested areas can be cleared for timber and fuel. Areas of low fertile land lend themselves well for farming. Uh, metal ores attract mining and people start set settling in areas with the advancement of te technology and the development of efficient ways of exploiting resources. So as a result of this, over exploitation of resources from an environment will start to influence the climate. So on a local level, clearing forests has impacts on things like transpiration, where we've got water vapour um, from being formed from, from trees uh, and plants and vegetation. Um, and that forms rain. And then you may have heard of temperate rainforests that once occupied much of Wales, but are now heavily reduced as a result of forest clearance, which started in the Bronze Age. So that's directly impacted climate on a local level. By now, uh, we're talking sort of in the Iron, Bronze, Bronze Age and Iron Age, that early human settlement, but by now resource exploitation is resulting in global climate change, which continues the cycle. So that's going to continue driving environment change and then further shaping how humans use their environment. 
So those really are the key themes that we're talking about when we're talking about Cherish. And we're trying to bring these all together, which perfectly sort of harmonises the, the, the topics that you teach in school um, with regards to humanities. So as part of the project, we've developed illustrations to help communicate the work that we do. So in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about some of the technical skills that are required to accomplish this project. My aim here uh, is to broaden your understanding of the careers that humanities can lead to. You're welcome to use these slides in your classrooms um, to help inspire the future generations. Um, and I'll send a copy. I'll send a copy of these slides to you at the end of this event. So this is just an illustration here just to sort of showcase all of the skills and technical roles that we've um, that we've had within Cherish. Um, some of which are quite complicated, but I've just picked out a select few that I think will probably appeal to um, younger audiences in particular. So if we start with paleo environmental research, um, this aspect of the project really informs us about cl past climates uh, and past environments. So if we start off with um, looking at things like pollen and diatoms under microscopes, this tells us what plants used to live in an area. Um, and this really informs us what the climate was like. So if we've got very wet conditions, then we're going to expect to see um, plants that grow in wet conditions and their pollen to be uh, retained within the sediments. We also can have a look at geochemistry, so the elements and the rock types that allows us to see where the origins of these sediments are, so where sediments have been moved from and to and, and possibly why. Things like charcoal in sediments uh, is a really good indicator of human occupation. Um, and uh, burning of burning of charcoal and therefore settlement in that area. We also can determine things like climate. So if we've got um, a wet, boggy environment, a historically wet, boggy environment, we can make start to make climatic assumptions like it, it being a rainy period during that time. But also if we have um, a drier sort of sediment layer, then we can we can determine that it was perhaps a, a drier period or that there was human influence impacting that area. Um, and then finally, we can have a look at sea level rise as well, which has been a really key focus for us at Cherish and looking at how the coastline of Wales and Ireland has changed. We can look at um, saline and freshwater environments to determine that sea level, um, that past sea level. So next we're going to have a look at archaeological excavation. So we've done a couple of um, archaeological excavations in Cherish, and this is probably more obviously reveals the structures beneath the surface. We can learn how the site was used by people and identify how long ago the site was occupied and during which age or ages it was occupied. Much of our excavation work of Cherish has included settlement sites from the Iron Age. So Iron Age forts on the coast, such as this one um, that you can see on the screen, is in uh, is Carvai, which is a promontory fort in Pembrokeshire. It sits right on the cliff edge, so it's perhaps considered a bold choice for a settlement site, um, but it really lends itself well to fishing, trading, seabirds and access to seabirds, and it's much easier to, def to defend than being more inland. And it's highlighting these key areas of, of coastal Wales that's going to sort of bring that world to life for young people when we're talking about people living in the Iron Age. Um, so next we've got aerial surveys. So this essentially means taking footage and photos from a plane or a, a drone. There are limitations with drones in that you need lots of good weather, but with uh, taking photos from um, a plane, you can go out in, in more than you can you can go out in more variable weather. This really is to see the wider landscape. It reveals things like crop marks, um, which demonstrate heritage sites. It's a way of identifying historical sites that, sites that might need protecting. Uh, we can also look at how vegetation is changing or how our landscape is changing. And we can cover a really good distance, um, but also have a look at different perspectives at different levels. So it's a really good tool uh, to use when we're sort of seeking out new heritage sites. 
airborne laser scanning, perhaps more a more of a technical um, career here, but uh, basically a laser light is sent from a source, a transmitter and reflected from objects. Um, and this reflected light is then detected uh, and used to develop a map. Um, so essentially this is used to accurately map archaeological features to produce new maps of all upstanding archaeology um, that Cherish has looked at. There's a couple of examples here. We've got Puffin Island, for example, which is really quite heavily vegetated and so not very easily, it's not very easy to see the archaeology, but if you use airborne laser scanning or LIDAR as it's more commonly known as, um, it can remove that vegetation layer. It's got a really high resolution, it's precise, um, and it's it's an emergent technology as well to for, for this sort of use. Um, Wales have got an initiative to try and get a whole LIDAR coverage of Wales, and this is to help with ad adaptation, things like producing flood maps. So it's a really relevant um, sort of career, particularly within Wales at the moment. This technology could then be fit to things like drones, which would make it cheaper and things like that. So whilst it seems quite inaccessible at the moment, I think with it being an emerging technology, it's going to really progress. Um, geophysical surveys. So this essentially looks beneath the surface to see what's buried. So it uses something called ground penetrating radar. And you'll see a di the, the diagram on the right shows data from ground penetrating radar. And this is a site up in North Wales, Dinas Dintley. And you can see these round circles here are actually the outlines of Iron Age roundhouses in uh, beneath the beneath the beneath the, the top layer of the of the sediment. You can also see some roads there, those straighter, longer pieces. So this is more of an exploratory way of, before you perhaps do your archaeological dig, just to see what's beneath the surface and to see if to see if there is anything beneath the surface. So we've used this we've used this technology up at Dinas Tintle prior to an excavation where we found um, 2000 year old roundhouse walls, intact walls there. Archaeological diving. So this is perhaps the most intriguing to our young people. It involves diving shipwrecks to reveal the hidden secrets of past climate and changing environments. This is an example of the bronze bell wreck where um, there are tons of marble beneath beneath the, um, beneath the sea and there are cannons and anchors that you can you can go and dive and observe. And you can see some of those in the animation. Um, the point of this is to quantify the change with things like plant growth and sediment cover. So again, we can start to see those sort of environmental changes that may be driven by climatic changes, but also gives us that window into the past of um, how our people lived and travelled and what they transported and how they traded and things like that. Um, the image at the bottom of the screen on the right is a bathymetry image that's that's actually included in one of the resources. And this, again, is, is almost like taking a, a really detailed high resolution scan of the seabed and that helps you to illustrate how the seabed is changing. So, again, it's a way of monitoring. So uh, I've come to the end of my section on Cherish and, and what, we're, what it's all about. I'm now going to introduce to you um, Professor Sarah Davis, who's going to be talking to you about communicating climate change. Uh, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now and um, pass over to Sarah. Hi there, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harriet, for the introduction and thank you all um, for joining us. I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. And I'm going to be talking to you about weather, climate and coastal change and how some exa some examples that we've produced from the Cherish project, and we'll we'll talk about these further when we when we discuss the resources. But really, how do we start to talk about weather and climate with um with our pupils? And the evidence for climate change is clear. Um, carbon dioxide 
levels in the atmosphere are going up and have been since instrumental records began in um, the late 1950s with the observatory opening at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. So this is the, the kind of, you know, the, the atmospheric picture we've, we've got increasing carbon dioxide concentrations. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and the Earth's temperature is rising. If we think about that in a longer term context and we put together all of the evidence that we've got from um, other kinds of sedimentary archives, because once we start going back beyond the instrumental period, we're relying on that proxy information from other sources. This record here is produced from the ice cores from the Antarctic ice sheet and take us back 800,000 years. And the um, increases and decreases that you can see in those CO2 concentrations are driven by glacial cycles. Um, so we have higher values when it's warmer and lower values when there is more ice on the planet and it is um, colder. So we've got strong evidence for that link between um, carbon dioxide concentrations and global temperatures. And this diagram really does put in perspective how far away from um, the um, from the norm we, we are. So we're up here at the moment, 2023, around about 420 parts per million, um, the highest levels that we've seen at least the last 800,000 years and much, much longer. Um, but what does that really mean for our students? How can we kind of convey that? Because talking about this is a rather nebulous concept um, and you know, we we talk about climate, but what we actually really experience is the weather. This quote is often tr attributed to Mark Twain. I think um, I read somewhere that it, it wasn't him. I can't remember who it was, but it's it's quite a nice sort of snapshot. Climate is what you expect. Climate is the sort of 30 year average of, of, of weather conditions, but it's actually the weather that we experience. And whilst trying to explain climate change to students can be quite complex and the first thing we need to think about is what's our understanding of climate and to, un to to think about what we understand from climate we need to think about well what do we what do we think about in terms of weather so I think it's sort of taking it back to those first principles the weather is what we experience climate is longer term weather weather averages and then um, we can think start then to think about the impacts of climate change. So weather is probably the best starting point and a hook to think about climate change. And I rather like this this quote from Miles Allen, who's a climate scientist at the University of Oxford, which is a nice way of expressing climate change. Climate is what you affect. The weather is what gets you. And certainly we have a lot of weather here um, in Wales, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, in, in a few minutes. But in terms of where we've come at, um, to with, with Cherish is, and, the, and the project is, is what are the impacts of climate change on coastal heritage and what kind of things might we be expecting to see? There's a whole range of impacts that um, will be affecting us around the coast of Wales and elsewhere across the British Isles and also on the island of Ireland as well. Um, relating to, to coastal to coastal heritage, which has been the, the main focus of Cherish. So with increasing global temperatures, we will expect to see um, sea level rise and rates of sea level rise are increasing. With more energy in the atmosphere, we will expect more intense storms, but also with rising sea levels, we will expect those storms to be impacting further inland as sea level rises. Um, Warmer atmosphere can hold um, more, more, more rainfall. So we, we expect and we are experiencing increased rainfall intensity. So those, you know, real, you know, um, intense, um, you know, um, downpours that we that we do experience. We, I think we can all sort of um, appreciate that we're seeing more of those um, and, and, and they're, they're becoming more, more frequent. Rising temperatures. Um, again leading to um uh, uh to sort of more general sort of warmer conditions we're expecting hotter drier summers and warmer wetter winters as we um as we um experience the impacts of climate change and drought is something that isn't necessarily what we associate with weather and climate in wales um 
but 2018 was a big drought year and we um we we saw the impacts of that with an increase in um in forest fires with exposures of archaeological material through crop marks um, and at the moment we're experiencing um you know uh, more prolonged dry conditions we're not in a drought yet although um the alert res the alert level has actually been raised today um given that we are experiencing this prolonged dry spell um through june and and um into next month as well so those are the kinds of impacts that we might um experience on coastal heritage but also of course they don't just impact on coastal heritage they will impact on communities infrastructure businesses and other aspects of our lives but coastal heritage is one lens through which we can explore climate change so thinking about the weather then um and 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 thinking about how we can talk about this with with students well our climate here in Wales is very is variable and we have um, quite strong topographic variation with the Cambrian Mountains running down the spine of, of Wales and with the Snowdonia mountain range, the Aruri um, uh, mountain range in the north and the Banai Brecheniog um, in the south. Um, so we've got strong orographic um, topographic effects but also we lie at the juncture of a number of air masses um, and um, in and, and that which of those we experience at any one time is governed by the position of the jet stream. So one of my predecessors at Aberystwyth wrote a textbook about weather and climate in Wales in the 1950s and, and, and suggested that in, in Wales, the significance of climate is decreased and weather assumes an importance such as that it enjoys in no other climatic type. So wherever the wet the, the jet stream is will determine whether we're getting warmer tropical air masses or colder polar air masses. And if the jet stream is right above us, then we might get some very exciting weather. So the jet stream um, is what really brings the weather across from the North Atlantic from, from the North Atlantic from the from the west to the to the eastern part of the North Atlantic and really drives that mid-latitude circulation. And the strength of the jet stream is really important in determining, you know, whether we have um, we have lots of storms and again where that jet stream is positioned over, over us or, or whether we are either either side of it. With climate change, we're expecting um, that the jet stream um, will is 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 being changed um and in in one sense we are expecting um the jet stream is is the signs that it's is starting to slow down and as it slows down it is becoming more wavy and as it becomes more wavy it's more likely that it gets stuck into these um particular positions known as blocking conditions um and and you might hear on the weather forecast things like the omega block which is the particular shape of, of more blocking conditions and when it gets stuck in those conditions we might have more prolonged dry conditions if we're one side more cold and dry conditions um or or more unsettled conditions so we we're, we're at the we're we're at the um, mercy of the jet stream and how that changes along with climate change i'm just going to give you a couple of examples of how the jet stream has impacted on our weather in recent times so between 2010 and 2012, we were in drought conditions. Um, we had um, a prolonged period of, of, of rainfall, much below average, and there was a lot of talk about hose pipe bans. Um, and, and that was literally just about to happen. And then from April 2012, um, the position of the jet stream shifted and brought along three months worth of extreme rainfall. The jet stream shifted to a more southerly location brought along some very strong North Atlantic um, lows across um, the UK. Here in Aberystwyth, um, we woke up to torrential rain, which flooded large parts of, of Aberystwyth and uh, the surrounding area. People were rescued from caravan parks, homes and businesses were flooded. So what we're also seeing with climate change then is we have these individual weather events, um, but we're we're also starting to see this um, sense of going not just having more of one particular type of weather extreme, but the sudden shift from one extreme to the other, in this case, drought to um, to very intense rainfall. And this is the wettest um, 
period of, of rainfall for um, on on record. We've also experienced uh, an increase um, occurrence of uh, stormy conditions. This is the the UK's stormiest uh, winter on record from 2013 to 14, and each of these low points here in this graph indicate individual storms that happened um, during that winter from the 1st of December through to the 1st of March. The blue line here is Stornoway um, a Meteorological Station and the red line is Valley on Anglesey. Um, and just to give you an idea what that looks like, um, this is the first two weeks of February. Um, you can see um, Wales is just here. And we were right in the firing line and here in Aberystwyth, um, the TV cameras were camped out on the promenade um, for a number of weeks. Um, there were and, and, you know, a lot of homes and businesses were affected. So these weather extremes are perhaps a route into talking about climate change and potential impacts with pupils. It's something that they experience and something that they will be um, familiar with. Um, and we can also use this, um, these kind of case studies of weather extremes to think about the other aspects relating to weather and climate. How do we respond? What are the impacts of extreme weather? Damage, loss, um, uh, the, the, the need to um, build defences, to, to um, adapt and change, but also stories of communities pulling together and helping each other. Uh, responding at a community level, at a, a local government level or a national level. So there is lots that we can explore from a humanities perspective about weather extremes and climate change, as well as the more technical scientific aspects as well. Now, taking a longer term perspective, um, one interesting aspect to explore about weather and climate change would be to, to, to look at that longer view over historic and, and um, longer timescales. So we can reconstruct past weather events and we can look at how we can reconstruct climate using evidence from sediment cores and paleo environmental reconstruction that Harriet mentioned um, a, a few minutes ago. We can use that historical information to identify past extremes and, and develop our understanding of, of the recurrence and magnitude of impacts of, of these events. But we can also use a historical lens to look at how individuals and communities responded and explore the social memory. And I think this is one area where um, there's an opportunity to talk about weather and climate with um, young young people through um, through exploring the, the the histories in their own um, communities. So one high profile example of, um, of of an extreme weather event that is that is memorialised and 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 well known in in Wales is the Royal Charter Storm and the, which happened on the twenty fifth to the twenty sixth of October eighteen fifty nine. There were 133 wrecks around the coast of Wales, um, shipwrecks around the coast of Wales as a result of this um, of, of this storm that occurred. But the one that's most famous, which caused the greatest loss of life of over 400 people, occurred off the coast of Moilvra and Anglesey. Um, a, a, a ship, the, the Royal Charter, was was on its return voyage from Australia and was coming into uh, to dock at Liverpool, but was cast aground. Um, uh, just off the coast and within within almost within touching distance of, of the coast with huge loss of life and a really, really traumatic experience for the community who pulled together to help who they could. Now, that weather event is something which is is very well known on Anglesey and and is more broadly in, entrenched in the in the mem weather memory of, of Wales. And, and again, is I know is an example that that is used within schools in Wales and and particularly in Anglesey to to explore the history of the community, but also can be used to talk more broadly about about the weather and weather extremes. So one thing that might be uh, an exercise that could be done with with pupils is to is to talk to them about what weather events they remember, what makes them memorable, and what do they associate them with. Some care needs to be taken because sometimes these weather events might be traumatic to them, particularly if they've had personal experiences of flooding or damage. Um, but they might also associate weather extremes um, with other kinds of, of memories. Um, often when we've talked to people about weather memories before, snow is a particularly 
um, memorable one for many for many children because um, sometimes it will mean a day off school. Um, there's fun associated with snowball fights and all those sorts of things. So there's a whole range of memories that come with exploring weather extremes. Um, some of them positive, some of them nostalgic, but some of them could be could be um, quite difficult um, as as well. So by exploring their own personal memories, then clearly that links to um, changing places theme and thinking about place based learning and, and specific examples from one's own community. In terms of thinking about a, a more historical perspective, um, so we've got personal memories and perhaps memories of relatives and and, um, and and such like, there's a range of historical sources available. The National Library has a vast array of resources, um, correspondence, newspaper articles and diaries are really good examples of the kinds of resources available. Just one example here from Anglesey is the um, diaries of William Bulkley, who um, who wrote his diaries during the, the mid 1700s and every day he wrote what the weather was doing. So he wrote about what was what was being farmed, the impacts of weather on farming. Um, so there's, there's, there's some valuable resources there. Those have all been transcribed and are available, freely available online through Bangor University. But one valuable resource that could be a potential source of, of um, activities for, for pupils is um, is the National Library of Wales is um, online uh, newspaper database, which is searchable um, and, and pulls up a rich um, range of material on past weather extremes. So that could be where, um, you know, um, young people could could access that resource to, to try to identify what resources might be available to them about their own local area, whether it's a coastal community or whether it's um, whether it, 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 it's it's um, it's more inland, urban, rural. There are lots of examples of, of flooding, of storms, of impacts um, that could be used as a, as a vehicle for discussion about about weather and climate. Um, so that's that's a fantastic, freely available resource. One of my favourite examples of, from there is is um, that we found during the project is this article um, about um, Borth, which is just north of Aberystwyth. And, and how the people are described as plucky um, and how every time there is a there is a storm that that causes all sorts of, of um, damage and, and devastation to the community, they kind of pick themselves back up and get things cleared up, ready to welcome the tourists back every summer. So um, that that's um, that's that's sort of one example of, of the, the kinds of information that's available with this with this historical perspective and also thinking about. Um, uh, you know, we often think about climate change being in the future and that we are going in this new direction. However, some of the problems that we're facing now and will do in the near future are not necessarily new problems. So um, in recent times, we've seen an increase in the incidence of the road at Newgale in Pembrokeshire um, being encroached by the shingle beach as the storms move um, lots of stones from the beach onto the road and there's a clear up operation every time there's a major storm. But we know from the historical record that these storms have happened previously and that the road has been affected in this case over 100 years ago. Geraldus Cambrensis writing, um, you know, writing 900 years ago, um, uh, talked about the, the impacts of, of um, storms at Newgale. So we can put the future changes and the current changes in that longer term context and, and, and sort of say, OK, well, these these things have happened before. Climate change is driving things um, in, in a particular way, but you know, we have had to adapt and change and, and respond to these kinds of things before. So we can put that in a longer term context. Another valuable resource for looking at historical weather is um, has been produced by Claire um, Natia, which is a, a, a subgroup of the Kamdeta Edward Floyd. Um, they've developed something called the Tewidiadir, which is effectively like a weather dictionary. And it's a it's an archive of lots and lots of, of descriptions of past weather events and impacts. Um, the this um, website is is entirely in the medium of Welsh, although um, individual records are always um, uh, preserved in the original language in which they were recorded. So that's another useful um, resource. 
So that's the, the kind of historical perspective about about weather and climate. If we take things a step further, I'll just mention a, a bit about what we've been doing in Cherish, taking a longer term perspective and just talk you through some of the key findings from our sites in North Wales, where we've been working at a whole range of sites from Frosnega um, on the southwest coast of Anglesey through um, down towards the Menai Strait and down to Morford Intley and Dinas Dintley. Um, and we've taken a, a, a sort of a, a multiple, a multifaceted approach, if you like, taking sediment cores from lakes and wetlands and also from the coast, um, taking uh, samples from archaeological excavations. And by working at a range of different sites, we've been able to pull together multiple lines of evidence to give us a, a clearer picture of how the environment has changed over millennia so that we can put our current changes into a longer term framework. And perhaps that helps us to think about how we might need to adapt and respond in the future. So just to give you a, a quick overview, I'll start from the north and just work my way around just to give you a, a flavour of the kinds of evidence that we have that we have found. So at Llyn Mylog in, in um, at our most northern site, um, we've taken sediment cores from Llyn Mylog, which reveal that 7,000 years ago, it wasn't a freshwater lake, it was a marine environment and the sea level um, there was, was higher. So that's a fundamentally different landscape to today and gives us food for thought about how that might change in the future. At Lynn Coron, which is um, a lake behind uh, the extensive dune system at Abba Frau, in the sediment cores that we found, we found evidence of increased storminess and sand dune movement um, around 3,000 years ago, 2,200 years ago, and 1,500 years ago. So we've got a really, we're, we're increasing our understanding of, of the storm history, of the sea level history. But how does that fit in with change in terms of communities? Uh, Hrithgaya, which is an early medieval settlement, it's buried by sand and plough and uh, the, the ridge and furrow systems are actually really well preserved. Um, they've been capped by a thick layer of sand. We know that they, we now know from the work that Cherish has done that those medieval fields were covered. They started to be covered around 900 years ago and that continued for about uh, 500 years. So increased storminess and, and, and sand movement during that medieval period over quite a prolonged period of time. Moving further south um, towards Morvid Inlay and Dinas Dinlay, where we've got a, a coastal spit at Morvid Inlay and um, we've, we've got an Iron Age settlement at Dinas Dinlay, we've got multiple lines of evidence of an Iron Age community that settled and lived in a quite a, a dynamic and changing landscape and, and Harriet will um, talk through that um, next. So putting all of this together and thinking about how we can communicate weather and climate with our young people, I think it's about trying to make something that is real to them. And the first point is weather. How do they experience weather? What does it mean to them? How might the weather change in the future? We might be talking about longer term global average but what we experience is the weather and that's possibly I think the best inroad and starting point for conversations about the broader impacts of climate change. And when we think about climate change and the coast in Wales, Fairbourne is a, a well-known case study. Um, it's a community going through very difficult times in terms of facing um, a very different future and there's been discussion about the, the residents of Fairbourne potentially being the UK's first climate refugees. I guess what the, the, the work of Cherish has shown is that, that actually a lot of our coastal landscapes are relatively young. They've changed a lot over time. They will undoubtedly change in the future because of climate change. And so we have to think about, rather than trying to keep things as they are, how do we adapt and change as we face an uncertain future? But perhaps these stories from the past give us some give us some hope that communities have adapted and been resilient to climate change in the past. And so there is, you know, there is there is scope for thinking about, OK, well, we can move forward by, you know, um, and and help using that longer term perspective to help us understand that the coastline has always been dynamic. It will continue to change and we can 
work out ways to adapt and live with that change going forward. Um, so I'll leave that there. Jochen Bauer, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. That was um, really insightful and, and really demonstrates that difference between weather and climate, which is, I'm sure, a difficult concept to get across to, to young people. Um, so we're actually now going to move on to um, working in small groups and just uh, participating in some activities now. Uh, I've pulled these directly from the resources. And the aim here is to showcase how some of the resources can be used, but also to broaden your understanding of humanities specific to Wales. Um, some of you may have more knowledge uh, about this. Um, we don't intend to patronise at all. Uh, this is your subject area, but hopefully, uh, you know these resources they're mainly designed for children but hopefully you'll be able to take something from it and i know that humanities has become a very broad um subject area now so um we're going to actually start off with the chron chronological story of wales so i'm going to put you into great great breakout rooms um your task is in groups to firstly have a quick introduction with one another i'm going to try and keep the groups the same i think i've worked out how to do that uh just name and where you work will do um, and then you can put the 15 events in chronological order uh, so i'm going to hopefully give about eight minutes or so um, for this task just feel free to pop down and um, drop down the numbers rather than writing the full sentences and then we'll come back in a few minutes to look at the answers um i'm not i'm not able to share files in the chat for some reason so i have just emailed all of your all of the attendees with a, a specific handout to this most of what is in that handout is going to be on the screen, but it's just just in case you wanted um, to split screen or something and have that handout next to you. OK, so. I'm just opening the breakout rooms now, so hopefully. You're going to be moved to those groups. Well done, Harriet. Thank you. I think that's clear. I'm just hoping I can't send. Um, I cannot send files, which was a shame. I was sort of banking on that, but mm -hmm. I have emailed. Yeah. OK. Right. OK. <laughs> Is that OK? Yeah. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine, is everything going OK with you? <laughs> OK, good.
absolutely rubbish at my history. Of being kicked <laughs> out. No. <laughs> right. That's 1200 or something. Um, again, there's, oh, I'm going to do, I'm not quite sure what princes they, um, they class under this. So, uh, begin, oh, beginning of the age of the princes. Hi everybody. Um, I hope I hope that worked. I'm really sorry if you ended up in a room by yourself. I think we had um, a few dropouts, just as I mentioned the word breakout room. Um, I, the intention of that was was more to sort of engage you in an activity rather than uh, scare you. But thank you so much for staying if you did and engaging with that activity. I can, you know, I heard Age of the Princes being. Um, uh, uh mentioned there which is funny because it was a personal personal battle for me uh trying to understand what on earth was going on during that time period having never really learned about it at school um anyway i'll put you all out of your misery now and i'll pop the answers up on the screen um so we're starting off with our mesolithic period um going through to the neolithic bronze age and iron age then we've got our Roman conquest, which is a bit later than the Roman conquest in England. So that's a little fun fact to share um, if you are educating on the Romans in Wales. Then we have our age of princes. Skip forward 400 years because it's really complicated uh, to the first Viking invasion. Um, then we have uh, Wales becoming a principality under English rule. This sparks really interesting debates uh, within the classroom, I think, um, so it's a really, you know, it's a really kind of exciting point to talk about. Then we have the Glyndwr uprising as a result of all of this. Um, we've got Henry the Seventh, born in Pembroke Castle, and then we come into the more, more sort of modern era and looking at things like the slate, slate quarry and bringing it back to the um, bringing it back to those three themes of cherish. This really is the beginning of that global scale. Um, climate change. So, you know, arguably is is Wales responsible for, you know, this I, the idea of this industrial revolution um, sort of kickstarting global climate change. Don't quote me on that. I don't necessarily think that's true. Um, then we've got the ironworks opening in Blaenavon, um, the last invasion of Britain, which was in Fishguard, the Rebecca riots and then the Seneth. So feel free to pop your um, scores in the chat. It would be interesting to know how many um, people got right with that one. <clears throat> so while we're um, while you're doing that, I'm just going to move on to uh, the next activity, which is choosing a settlement site. So again, this is probably aimed at younger um, progression steps. Now you're a small community choosing somewhere to live and settle during the Iron Age. You'll need access to resources to survive and not all of the sites have the resources you need. Some of them need to be traded or farmed. Therefore, your site needs to be accessible uh, and defendable. So your task is to think about the natural resources that are required for everyday life in the Iron Age. Just prepare a really quick list uh, of requirements for your settlement site under the following categories. I've given you some prompts there. So features within the land. Do you want it to be coastal or inland? Um, what sort of metals are you going to be expected to need? Um, think of the plants that might be needed and some of the animals as well. So hopefully... Um, I'll be able to assign you back into your uh, breakout rooms. I might do a bit of adjusting just to make sure that there's enough people in each room. But good luck with this one. And I'll see you back here in about eight minutes or so.
uh, splitting a, a piece of stone, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. It, does, it looks very odd to me. Um, and, then, and we've got the ladies weaving. Yeah. So I imagine they're weaving wool there, aren't they? So they're able would, to make would, cloth. Yeah, I would think it'll okay. be it'll be wool. Yes, yes. Um, and and um, they have that from their animals, and then they've got uh, uh, them off to do some ploughing. So they would be growing food at that time. So discuss with your group of folk. How might this impact? Oh no, that's landscape change. Oh, that's so, I so we're still yes. on that first stage of choosing a settlement site. So, as so far as the, the metals go, I, iron would be useful, I guess. Yeah. The only other, yeah. if we're in Wales, um, we might find yeah. copper or yeah. gold, but I don't. Yeah. I don't think we're going to find any any tin. So I, I we'd have to trade if we wanted to make bronze. Um, so, well, but, uh, Dan, I, I'm, I'm here not very far from St David's and we've got copper in the area. Yes. And, um, oh, do you know, I'm not absolutely sure what the nearest little mine to us, whether it is, whether it, uh, I'm not sure if it is copper near Solver. But oh, there were yeah. I, I know the place you mean. Uh, I, I think back. I think back in the uh, in in these days, the Iron Age sort of period, there was a uh, a lot of these metals were a, a lot more widespread than than we realise now because they were mostly uh, scraping things that they could see on the surface, which yes, of course yes. have, have long gone now. Um, and I think certainly, certainly. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I, sorry, we're back in the main room now, but thank you um, for your very interesting discussion. I, I totally, <laughs> you're totally on the right tracks there with um, metals. So I've just put a really small, um, concise list together here of the sort of things you might um, need. So our land features, um, generally coastal because it's sort of easier to defend. We've got more trading routes, accessible, accessibility to trading routes, perhaps. Um, but you might have a slightly harsher climate, so it is a trade-off. You also obviously need to be near a freshwater source, that's quite key. Um, ideally, a hill uh, within uh, sort of above flatter land is also really, really helpful, again, from a defence point of view. Uh, access to forest um, and clay is, is also really important. So the sort of metals that um, we might find in Wales iron, um, gold, um, and, you know, obviously with the development of or the um, discovery of iron that really, really um, revolutionised human occupation. Um, with regards to plants, so uh, we've got things like willow, that's really good for weaving. And with this particular activity, it's really nice to get real examples of these um, materials so that you can so that um, children can interact with these materials and really understand how they how they work and give weaving a go. You can make some really simple hoops or something with some willow if you can get your hands on it. I know it's really difficult to do these sorts of things um, for a class of 30. There you go. Stephen's showing us a really nice willow basket there. Um, so hazel, again, is really important. It was a re really important um, tree. So we could coppice hazel and then that could make the foundations for the walls of a an Iron Age roundhouse, um, a wattle and daub roundhouse. Things like oak and ash could be used for timber, but also for making boats. Um, flax is an interesting one because the fibres from it can be used to make textiles. Uh, and there's an entire YouTube video on how to make fibres, uh, textiles from flax, if you um, want to sit and watch that. It was re really very relaxing and interesting to watch. Cereals and grains, obviously, are an important one for farming um, and then herbs for medicinal purposes and also um, uh, food as well. And then the sorts of animals we might be using, I think, uh, keeping, uh, farming, either, either, either farming them or hunting them. Sheep, obviously, for their wool. Um, pigs, cattle, dogs for protection and de defence, and then also hunting things like deer. So, thank you for that. I hope I hope that's um, sort of along the lines of what you were thinking.
uh, there's there's more there's more information within the resource packs relating to these sorts of activities. So you won't just be left completely on your own when it comes to finding out this information. But I will talk more about that a, bit, a little bit later. So again, coming back to those three three themes um, within Cherish, we're just now going to look at a more sort of um, geographical element, I suppose. So looking at um, landscapes, this particular activity you might want to, uh, it's, I think I've targeted at either progression step three or four, so more aimed at secondary school teachers perhaps. Um, but this is looking at landscape change and more specifically erosion. This illustration um, is based off of it's it's fictional, but it is based off one of our sites in Wales. Um, it, it's actually a, a, a combination of sites in Wales. So we do have a scenario where we've got erosion of uh, heritage sites. So you can see the ramparts of an Iron Age hill fort here. Um, but then we've also got that sort of contrast with modern day and erosion of people's back gardens. And link to um, something like Nevin uh, is in the is in the resources where you've really got that sort of landslide scenario going on and people's back gardens um, ending up on the beach below. So if we just quickly go through what um, what what we observe here. So we have cracks on the land and in the cliff face. Uh, they're created with the expansion and contraction of material heated by the sun, or it could be through freeze thaw processes. So then when rail rain falls onto the ground at the top, uh, denoted by number two, the water then travels through those cracks and creates tunnels inside the cliffs where there are weaknesses in the material. At three, We've got the water emerging lower down the cliff face as it meets more resistant, you know, more resistant impermeable layer. And the water actually starts to act as a lubricant at this point and it destabilizes the cliff, causing material higher up to fall due to gravitational force. Um, gullies also form on the exposed slope and they start to widen. Um, Number four is demonstrating our biological factors like burrowing animals and nesting birds. They also, on a small, much smaller scale, they do contribute to erosion. They remove sediments and they also contribute to those underground tunnels where water can flow. Um, after intense rainfall events, following periods of drier conditions or drought, the lubrication effect of the water can be so significant that these large amounts of land are lost from the cliff and that's going to cause the landslide. So it's in, it's predicted that these um, uh, this particular erosion process could increase with climate change uh, because of the frequency and intensity of rainfall and drought periods um, increases. We've also got a the, the point number seven, you've also got rising sea levels, which will erode the cliff uh, at the base. Um, so this diagram, yes, it demonstrates sort of natural erosion processes, but you can then talk about it in the context of climate change and how that might be accelerating these processes. And this is directly and this is an exact um, example that we can take from from the coast of Wales. So it, it's it's relatable and, you know, you don't have to be looking at the other side of the world to see the effects of climate change, even if it is impacting perhaps a small, a very small community. But it raises some of these questions such as, you know, how might this impact heritage sites? Is it important that we protect these heritage sites? Um, how is this landscape change going to uh, affect present and future communities? And can we protect can we protect future generations? And if so, how? So it it really throws up some nice discussion points that you can use in the classroom, um, looking at you know whether people whether whether children think feel it's important protect, to protect these heritage sites, or yeah, and I, I think it can it can really open up that discussion quite nicely. Um, so. Uh, I'm just going to move on now to the Dinas Dinche animation and I know I think for the interest of time I'm just going to keep this um, quite brief and not go into breakout rooms but um, what I, I'm going to send you links to the animation now we've we've only just sort of had this finalized so it's really exciting output for Cherish. Um, it's based on the Dinas Dinche uh, hill fort in Gwynedd. It's at risk of erosion 
Um, the wider landscape has also changed a lot over time too. So we're going to observe those three themes and cherish in the animation. So the climate, the landscape and, and people. Um, ideally, while you're watching this animation, identify the elements of environmental and climate change and identify how the communities using Dinas Dintle have changed over time. Um, and just have a think about how those three themes of Cherish interweave through the story of Dean Astintle. So I'm going to post in the chat the um, English. We've got an English and a Welsh version of this. So just choose whichever one you want to watch. Um, I'm going to give you perhaps five minutes uh, from now for you to have a look at that animation in your own time on your own screens. I'm not going to stream it because I think there might be a bit too much lag uh, and I can't stream English and Welsh at the same time. So have a look at that and I will be back with you in about five minutes.
OK, hopefully you've had enough time to watch it. Um, if not, apologies, you can finish that off uh, in your own time. Uh, hopefully that's it. You can uh, hopefully that can be a resource that you can use in the classroom to showcase um, this idea of changing climate and landscapes and people over time. Um, and it showcases a lot of the work that we've we've done uh, in Cherish. So. Finally, then we're going to just move on to the resources and I'll probably wrap this up in about five, five to ten minutes now. Um, so this uh, the resources are they've all they all sort of look quite similar. So there's some nice branding there for you to kind of. Um, identify that it's a cherished resource, I suppose. Um, it highlights the progression step in the top right. Uh, the core concepts just gives a brief overview of the resource and its contents. We've worked with Curriculum for Wales um, officials to, to produce these resources. So whilst they're not directive in terms of how you might use them in the classroom, there's lots of information in them and then suggested activities to go alongside them. But more importantly, it helps you alongside your curriculum um, planning. So we've got the statements of what matter links in there, uh, the descriptions of learning uh, and of course the progression step as well. So those key elements help you help to inform your planning. The guidance section gives you a bit of content in terms of uh, a little bit of history or um, if it's to do with more archaeology sort of um, concepts but if it's you know to, to do with landscape it might give some more some processes um, there'll be text there might be diagrams to us to accompany the text but again you can you can use these resources however you want to and it gives you that flexibility to go into as much or as little detail as you want there are it's they're packed with um, suggested activities um, which relate to the content within the guidance of the resource. There are also hyperlinks embedded within them, so that will take you to external websites. It might take you uh, to more Cherish um, animations or films, or it might actually take you to uh, other sort of external education resources that I found that overlap with the work that Cherish has done. Um, so hopefully those 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 suggested activities have been um, designed in mind for the progression step that the resource targets. But it, there's nothing to say you couldn't use them for different progression steps. It's about having that versatility with the with with these resources that's important. Um, finally, you might also find that there are printable pages within the resources as well. So um, this particular task relates back to the second task that we did today, which was looking at the natural resources that you might need um, during the Iron Age. So you can print out some information sheets that have got some nice pictures or diagrams on them um, or illustrations or photographs um, just to sort of highlight and bring those th those concepts to life. So to find our resources, I'm going to send an email with all the files containing the resources um, in the next couple of days. Um, they are bilingual, they're completely free. Please share them with your colleagues and people, um, other people working within the humanities. Um, we are pending approval for their up upload to Hub. So there's a central point for, you, for, them uh, for them on there. They'll also be on the Cherish website. So if you ever lose that email, just um, go to the Cherish website. There's also other useful resources. I know that Sarah mentioned a few of them in her talk, um, but there's, there's also the Dean Austin Clay Animation. We've got an educational film coming out this week. Covline, which is, um, is one resource designed specifically for Covline. It's to access information on scheduled monuments, which is really helpful if you want to see what sort of historical sites you've got in your area. There's bound to be one if it's Mesolithic or Neolithic or even Bronze Age, Iron Age, there will be something in your area that you'll be able to research on Covline, identify it and build an activity around it. Um, so I'm just going to um, give you now an opportunity to ask any questions in the Q&A or the chat. We're monitoring them both. Um, I'm also going to put a link in the chat to a feedback form. It'll take you three minutes to um, fill out if you could fill that out that would be really really helpful to us 
uh, just to sort of inform us on how helpful this has been. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to leave it there for today and just thank you all again for attending, listening and participating. I really hope that you've been able to take something away from from to, take something away with you from today. Uh, and as I said, I will send out the resources in the next few days. Um, but thank you anyway. And um, this is the end of the event, but feel free to ask any more questions if you need to. Thanks. <laughs>